Nelly for starting us off. Uh, I'd like to get into our first panel, and uh, our moderator for this panel will be my colleague from CITI, Professor Al Katz. Hi, good morning. Um, so moderators moderate, um, but I'm going to introduce uh, the biographies of each of the uh, speakers because you have the, um, uh, the details in some of the handouts. And uh, I'm going to use then the time that I would spend uh, explaining uh, who's going to uh, address us, talk a little, bit, a little bit about setting the context of the, what the discussion is going to be all about. So the title of our panel is Business Models for Network Operators in an OTT World. Uh, we could literally, so where's the money? Or is there a business model? Are we going to survive in an OTT world? Um, and uh, there are two concepts that I think are very important to uh, raise in terms of the discussion we are, we are about to have. The first one is, what is a business model? Uh, because contrary to popular uh, wisdom, business model is not just about where the money is. A business model is a set of choices that have to do uh, uh, how a firm operates, um, what do we need in terms of operational policies and resources, and uh, obviously there's a profit formula, how are we going to make money, uh, but uh, in addition to that is what kind of product, what kind of value proposition are we having to the market? So when, when, when you're going to address the issue of business models, I would like you to go beyond just purely uh, the profit side of it, uh, particularly because in handling some of those value propositions, that would entail a dramatic transformation of what a telco traditionally has been. And, and, and I want to put pressure on that question to see whether uh, telcos are actually capable of transforming themselves in order to deliver some of these new uh, business models. Uh, second concept is OTT. And OTT is about this intermediation uh, in the value chain, as, as, as uh, Ian mentioned it before. Um, and uh, granted, the, the game is not over yet, because the issue of where the money is is not only part of a tough responsibility, it's also responsibility for the OTT players. Uh, Witness, Skype, um, roughly $900 million in revenue, the largest international long distance carrier in the world, uh, marginally you know, breaking even and moving forward, but, but nevertheless, in an industry that has a collapsed price realization. So um, for the OTT players, there is a question to be answered as to, well, how are they going to make money? How are they going to generate profits here as well? So, key questions for the panel. Number one, what are the alternative business models? And in particular, um, you know, is uh, two-sided marketing, as it has been said, something that is the uh, magic solution, or are there something uh, other propositions that need to be put in place in order to respond to the question. Second one, uh, is there enough money in the alternative business models uh, to compensate for the drop in voice revenue? Because we know that broadband is not actually compensating that drop, so where are you going to make money from? Uh, third, is there going to be any collaboration among telcos and other players in the value chain? Because alone, they cannot respond to the threat of OTT. And, and finally, what are the transformational challenges? If there is a response from a, a new business model, how are they going to change organization, processes, culture, and skills to actually meet that kind of a requirement? Um, I know that um, we have, those are very important questions. Let's try to address them from a TED kind of formula where each of you have 10 minutes. That will take us to uh, uh, 10.30, and that will give us some time for Q&A after we finish. And let's proceed. Right to left. So, please, um, Vincent. Vincent, start, and um, and we'll go from there. Okay. Um, so I'm going to be touching on on two sided models, uh, one to to telcos, and uh, especially to telco assets. So I'll try to understand to to answer to the question. I hope so. Um, so. We're not going to start with some context. I mean, the telco, uh, as probably many, many uh, companies, can be uh, can be identified through three different types of jobs, which are the infrastructure on one side, uh, the associated services, and the customer management. Obviously, on the infrastructure, you have the network, which is key, and you say our connectivity and more and more now access with 
huge issue about the capex and the cost and so optimization that can be done, but how to leverage that. Uh, then we have the associated services, so they have, yeah, they, their services that are not totally integrated uh, with, the, with, the, with the network that can come on top of it, and obviously on top of it can come also from other players, in fact, not just from telcos. So here we have video services, we have devices in which telcos are trying to uh, diversify and so on. Uh, there's plenty of business models here, uh, and these are brand new models with advertising, subscription, pay per use, bundles, I mean, which will take you to pay directly for it, and so on. Then there is uh, a final asset, which is the, the customer management. Uh, with the customer bases, the database of personal data, and for some players, the physical shops, in which you can also use for cost selling, app selling. Second answer, you, 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 your user and your clients. Um, for all of those solutions, obviously, when doctors are looking at their business model, they're trying to optimize the, those costs. So three times of cost. I mean, they're going to they're going to try they're going to try to uh, economies of sales for the network, for the devices, and so on. They're going to try to optimize the IT. Uh, what we're going to look at is how it can be used also to generate revenue. Uh, at, from a two-sided uh, perspective. Uh, why is it key? Because OTT players are already doing it anywhere uh, in two-sided models. And when you approach it, uh, they, can have, they can have a very disruptive approach uh, for telcos. For existing telco products, uh, we talk a little bit about voice over IP. And for products also on, on which telcos uh, uh, have decided to build a lot of their business models on video, for instance. So, and obviously there's a big competition. I mean, uh, the bigger OTT have uh, a larger user base, not necessarily clients, but probably a larger user base, so some capacity of, of reaction. I mean, if you, we take the example of, of Google, we, we have like seven, eight hundred million of users, and there are more than one million of clients and advertisers, so it's, it's, it's really big. At the same time, we know that a lot of the debate is also about FHI-related aspects, with any way the traffic will be supported by telcos, and in many, many cases it's going to be uh, uh, false to free, uh, and this it will circumvent the telco initiatives uh, in, 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 uh, in, the, in their approach of cloud generation. So to sign a business model, we can apply it to the three main assets we discussed uh, early on, the infrastructure, the associated services, and the customer management. But on the end user side, obviously, somehow I'll say telcos are more advanced. This is the, the retail organization. Uh, there are a lot of new initiatives still coming on with just pricing that I will touch very rapidly after. Then there are many services that have been launched. Some of them are just pure copycat of OTT services, and often they don't work, or at least they don't succeed. Then there is everything about the personal information management that can be done. On the other side, selling to OTT, but also to third parties in general, I would say. There's not only OTT uh, and the Netflix and the Amazon and so on, there's, there's everybody else, there's banks, governments, and so on. Uh, there are also very, uh, there are also new initiatives uh, that, are, that, are, that are being tested in the market. Um, so, first of all, if we, if we con concentrate on the infrastructure side, and in fact, the way to sell broadband, the way to sell traffic. You can sell it on, on, on a volume basis, you can sell it on a QS basis, you can sell it on a service content device basis without going back to any traffic and volume and, and QS issues. And we will see during the day also on the position uh, to go for rubbish sharing options, for instance. So I, I will not touch too much on the, uh, on the end user side. There are plenty of initiatives and, and at least, I mean, some, some um, QS options are being developed, in which there is there is uh, a check pricing on QS, uh, especially at least on throughput basis. Um, those initiatives are, are working somehow for cable operators, um, and there are some initiatives for mobile. On the other side, what we can do for uh, what, what companies are trying to do with the parties on the volume. I mean, this is the interconnection. This is procuring in fact. Uh, this is pushed, for instance, a lot by Comcast here. There's been a lot of debate with the, uh, the, the Lolo 3 Netflix case. 
this is also pushed in Europe, I mean, and we've seen, for instance, last week, the trust authority uh, in France say that Orange has the right to ask for a payment to Cogent. Um, so there are a, a, a few, and all of the operators are looking at that, and, and, and they're, they're trying to make pay at least CDN players, and they're trying to, to have the biggest OTT players like that. On the QS basis, there are many initiatives, but probably the, the most uh, important one so far has been Tartos CDN. This is a challenge because this is new for Tartos for somehow, uh, and uh, this is our, I mean, this is trying to, to replace the combined of words, uh, and at least on a local basis. So there are plenty of initiatives that have been big players in the US, like AT&T, launching very early. And we can see there is a challenge because AT&T, very recently, in fact, this summer, is changing its position on that. And it's looking at, OK, I'm going to partner with Akamai, I'm going to resell things. In Europe, we have very different player with Orange, with Telefonica, and has been really gone full scale. So this is really interesting to, to also to discuss later. Uh, then you have, okay, hey, I, I don't know how to sell that traffic, I'm going to see somebody else uh, and he's going to bundle it with even not talking about necessarily traffic. And you have all of the machine-to-machine -machine initiatives, in fact, I mean, in which most of the consumers and most of the, 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 the customers are not going to buy really traffic. I mean, they, they buy some, some traffic, but what they sell really to the end user is not traffic, you don't know there is at and or Orange Behind or SFO or whatever. Uh, you buy uh, a service, a complete service, and you have. Um, but there is not just traffic that can be sold. Uh, and, and we discussed that. There is the role of the player, the, the, of Telcos as an aggregator, so now, uh, and, and the fact that uh, you can provide services that are directly linked to the network uh, as a platform, as a broker, as a store. Uh, and a lot of initiatives are being uh, pushed around network APIs in which you can expose some assets of, of the network here. And, and I'll say, being in conferences around that and, and talking with, with Telco, it's not moving that fast, especially that we've seen, in fact, Telco's evolving to, okay, we're going to try to touch on the long tail developers, and now they're refocusing, which I believe is more interesting, on, on big partners, so big banks, big government, and so on, which is, which, um, implies more customization, but uh, potentially, I think, more profit. Then there is something to finish and conclude, on which um, OTTs have been very good, which is the uh, monetization of, of personal data. Uh, and, and so far, I'd say that uh, Telcos have been really um, going very slowly to that, for many reasons, and privacy aspects, and so on, uh, but how to to generate really revenues from that. Um, we've seen many, many initiatives from the Telcos, uh, from the OTTs, with targeting, with numerous things. And, and this is probably where also there is additional uh, revenue that is so far very limitedly uh, exploited I mean, for just internal efforts somehow. So we're seeing a lot more now like localization API, location API, sorry. Um, yeah. Does everybody turn off their cell <laughs> Yeah, it's a reminder for everybody. Uh, so so there, there are many initiatives here in which aggregated data, individual data, which can be anonymized or not, depending on what's going to be the initiative, uh, can be pushed. And we're seeing some, some first services really being, being, being pushed here. But so far, it, it's, been, it's been really, really small. I mean, there are also other assets that can be used for urban planning, like, okay, where are the cell phones moving, and so on. So there are many things with audience measurement. Obviously, one of the big challenges here is going to be the scope, the fact that users have only, the, the, the hotel telcos have only a limited part of the assets. So at least for that part, they will have to cooperate to find a way to, to sell those data, I think. So, I think. Unless, I mean, you're a big player in, 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 a, in a market that you can manage. So that's it for me. Uh, I'm only... Perfect. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we'll, if you were to take a couple of, of, of conclusions out of, of what a uh, business presentation is, there's no such a thing as a silver bullet. There, there are many options to be considered. Uh, secondly, that is going to put pressure on the telcos to, to innovate better. 
and probably on the speed side. Uh, traditional speeds of taking a year to develop a product or, or a new business model don't work out in this kind of an industry. And so that's going to be a fundamental question to talk to us. And, and third, the collaboration. Um, and, and with this, let's move to the next uh, speaker, uh, coming from a telco. So um, please, Jackie, uh, from Verizon, is going to present Verizon's perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Voice here. Can everybody see me? <laughs> no, I, I, think, I think we're okay. So, good morning. It's great to see so many friends here and have the opportunity to be a part of this always interesting conference. The annual conference uh, with EDOT, I think, is uh, one of the best that we have. And I'm going to use Verizon as a sort of a case study for a lot of the things we've just heard about. Talk about our business model specifically. But first, uh, a, a couple of uh, thoughts on context, and then if I have time at the end, a couple of thoughts on the proposals for international rules in this area. So uh, it's, it's fitting that uh, we're doing this conference the day after the Broadband Commission met, the UN Broad Com Broadband Commission on Digital Development which is jointly chaired by the ITU and UNESCO. And it reminds us of our shared goal of ubiquitous connectivity for everyone, everywhere, which requires substantial investments and has amazing societal and economic opportunities if we do it right. The commission has been a great source of vision and practical guidance. And I'm looking forward very much to having Secretary General of the ITU, Hamid Touri here, I hope you will talk to him about that because he's been a real leader in making all of that uh, all of that work. There is a very direct link between that sort of a vision and what companies like ours are recognizing more and more. Our annual report this year said the enduring source of Verizon's value is the central role we play in an industry vital to the global economy and deeply embedded in the lives of our customers. So it's with that nature that we're in this environment, which looks dynamic and busy because it, it is. It's the digital economy that is highly dynamic and has been so for some time. I think our previous speaker was commenting on that. Innovation and competition from many different sources are constant, which has created greater source for consumers and has driven major investment. In the US, the broadband industry has invested $1.2 trillion from 1996 to 2011. So no company can rely solely in this context on traditional services or business models, nor can we succeed without collaborating with other players. A competitor in one setting is a collaborator in another, particularly as we look at the innovation under which we are pressured to, uh, to, to create. These, uh, these shifts have been disruptive, and the new business models, like other innovations, uh, have involved risks and often skepticism from the capital markets. The phenomenon of large and rapid increases in data traffic that we're talking about today is just one dimension of this dynamic transition. And I think it was helpful for Raul to say we're talking about business models generally and uh, that's what I'm trying to do in sharing our experience. So here we are. Verizon, what have we been doing in this context? We've been transforming first our networks. So the idea here is to build outstanding and higher capacity networks that have the potential to deliver these remarkable services and to which innovators are eager to build and to create. So we have our fiber of the home network called Fios, and we have our nationwide fourth generation LTE. We began the fiber deployment in 2004, invested 23 billion. Fios now accounts for more than 60% of our wireline revenues uh, and helps make up for the decline in our, our uh, revenues from traditional wireline services. Our backhaul and our global networks became IP-based a long time ago, and now we've rolled out on fourth generation LTE to cover about 260 million people. All of this 
investment in advanced networks has given us the capability for innovation, which is fueled by collaboration and partnering. Um, we're making it easy for innovators to work with us. We have an application innovation center in San Francisco, an LTE innovation center in Waltham, Massachusetts, a 4G venture fund, and through the development of cutting edge devices and applications, together we can truly tap the potential of these high powered networks. We've also been figuring out ways to expand into new areas of business that leverage those world class networks. So we've moved into these areas organically and through acquisitions. When we merged with uh, MCI in 2006, along with that came CyberTrust, which is specialist in security services. In last year, we acquired Termark and CloudSwitch, very important in, in the cloud space. And this year, Hughes Telematics, which is one of the largest makers of connected car technologies, emergency notification, tracking stolen cars, and remote diagnostic services. Which brings me to the fact that so much of the future has to do with connected devices. So M to M or the Internet of Things is all sound very impersonal, but actually these are services that are hugely important in, in daily lives for driving safety, healthcare, energy management. From a business model perspective, we're leveraging our expertise that I mentioned in, in security and systems integration to address these huge unmet needs for technology solutions in the healthcare marketplace. We're working with manufacturers and utility companies to embed M to M telematics in cars and utility grids, which offers a new way to attack the energy conservation issue. So as we bring these new solutions to the marketplace, we will drive shareholder value by diversifying our revenues, leveraging our existing capital investment, and broadening our global reach. Now, by definition, many of the things I've been describing are data-intensive services. Not surprisingly, we also see change and new business models in our IP interconnection and content distribution. So, as has been suggested in previous slides, we offer a wide range of commercial options, we do unpaid peering, paid peering, traditional transit. We have something called partner ports, which is a way to interconnect with our US network closer to where the content will be delivered, which gives better, uh, better uh, quality. CDNs, and we have a digital media service, which is the content distribution. And our, uh, secondly, and importantly, our technologists and our engineers are very focused on making our networks more and more efficient. So bringing down costs, which then, of course, uh, is important for the business model. So this is, this is the picture that I'm trying to paint of what we, as a company, have been doing in this changing world. Now, a piece of that, of course, is OTTs, but there are many other things that are going on that, that are happening to us, that we're immersed in, and that we're doing. So my final bit here. How about the uh, proposals for new international telecom rules? A lot of discussion on those. We have various specific proposals, uh, for the, including for the ITU treating that we'll all be focusing on, uh, well, we already are, but certainly uh, decisively at the end of the year. Um, I want to just have a few thoughts on how those relate to innovation and changing business models. What I've been described is a lot about the US, but there are also very positive changes happening globally with international traffic, internet exchange points, aggregation of content coming into big peering centers, which then allows peering where it might not have been possible, cloud services, which is we've described as another way of getting value out of traditional networks. The most rapid uptake of those are in Latin America and Asia, and the cost of transport, international transport, or transport into uh, other countries are decreasing as there are more and more undersea cables, or there's more competition in, in, uh, inside the country for backhaul and so on. And then we see, of course, the prospect of combining M to M with the mobile miracle and uh, focusing on services like uh, healthcare services. All of these are evolving through a lot of change and a lot of innovation, just like we have seen with the Verizon story. Not exactly the same way, but in a similar way. And they offer societal benefits, economic growth, but also new ways to monetize data. 
So I just want to put that out there. The trends are positive. To me, the question is, how do we accelerate them? And how do we make sure we don't do something, particularly by codifying a rule that may seem wise at the moment, codifying it globally, uh, and in fact, instead, uh, instead of accelerating the progress, end up undermining it. Uh, if, if we uh, get something wrong in terms of the freezing business models in place to be able So, more discussion on that later, but uh, in the meantime, I hope I've been able to share a, uh, a good and interesting picture of what we're doing at Verizon. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, clearly, she outlined uh, a business model that is pretty fitting on state of the art transport infrastructure occupying and dominating that transport uh, portion of the value chain, uh, solutions driven as well uh, on uh, focused on vertical markets, plus the, um, the notion of how dependent that is to some of the regulatory and policy arrangements that we're, we're going to be discussing throughout the day. Um, let's take a now we'll look to uh, another um, telco moving to Europe. So, uh, Stefan Dufour is going to give us his perspective on business models for uh, uh, Switzerland and Europe as well. Thank you. <laughs> Why not? Thank you. So, it's always a great pleasure to be invited here to uh, say a few things. Um, I'm going to share with you a perspective on the business model and pricing from a small uh, operator. And um, because I think we are on, um, on the dynamic. Uh, which forces us to think reasonably deeply on where are, how can we make money in the future. When I think about pricing and business model, I generally see, keep three things in mind. The first thing is a conviction that the internet is an ecosystem. So that means we would not leave a telco if there won't be an Apple doing devices or a Samsung, if there won't be a Google for surfing the internet, if there won't be an eBay to, become, to do uh, online uh, purchases. And they would not exist if there won't be an infrastructure. And that's something that I keep in mind because we, I often see an antagonism in discussions, but actually for me it's an ecosystem. The second thing that I keep in mind when I think about business models is Google is not a very bad example of success in the internet. But still, its output is roughly $25 a year. We, as Telco, we make $70 a month. So we say a few things. That says first, no, I'm reasonably relaxed that these guys won't invest in the infrastructure because they can't afford it. The second thing is, I can dream on invoicing them the traffic, on making APIs and on whatsoever. I will never be rich with that. Because the order of magnitudes are simply not the same. The third point I keep in mind is I barely hear about the customer. And all these technologies, they are part of our life. And if we rethink the pricing models, if we rethink the business models from the perspective of the customer, though I tend to believe we will find new routes generating value and expanding the ecosystem. And that's, the, that's an example I want to take with you today. Now, when you look at, and it was said earlier, at the revenue of a telco, you know, still a huge proportion of our revenue and margin comes from voice and SMS. So naturally, we don't, like, you know, it's roughly 50% half of that, which is of metered revenue. And when we look, and I think all of you in the room, me first, you know, how do I make phone calls? You know, how did I make phone calls from the airport coming here? I did use FaceTime. How do I change uh, uh, SMSs? I use WhatsApp. So I don't use, as a telco person, so I don't want to be in the press for that, but I don't use these services that we provide because the others, they are simply more convenient. They are simply richer. So fighting this is useless because from a customer perspective, that's what I want. So naturally the tension is, how do we take this pot of revenue, this 50%, that will be, some say, cannibalized with that, and preserve that to make the investment. Actually, we need to reinvent the way we think this ecosystem. And in internet players, they provide a lot of value in unlocking new usage, new communication forms, new services, new technologies for our daily life, and so on and so forth. 
let's remember that we as an industry, it's sad to say, have not been very innovative. You know, since 130 years, what did we do? You know, voice, maybe SMS. I'm not, not even sure we did it. I think some of the vendors did it. You know, the fax was not even for us. OTT services were, were, were existing for a long time ago. You no know, fax, we never did it. And since then, nothing. So we are kind of a Coca-Cola business. You know, one product, super simple. Now, we have a role to scale this internet. We need to invest in this infrastructure, fiber everywhere, ultra broadband in mobile, faster adoption. You know, we forget that one of our roles is to foster adoption. You know, how many iPhones would Apple sell without the subsidies of Apple? So you see this balance of the ecosystem, which we, which we need to reinforce. Now, what we did in Switzerland, we did introduce in June a new pricing on mobile, and that's the example I want to use which is reasonably disruptive. We went for full flat everywhere. But we're not because we want to kill the company. You know, we don't want to kill the company. We are one of the most profitable operators in Europe. But simply because, from a user perspective, it doesn't make any sense to do otherwise. The examples I use, I, I use FaceTime to make my communication. I use WhatsApp to make SMS. So this is gone. Let's accept it. So why don't we make unmetered on our own services? Then comes data, which is the last leg of our pricing. The data, most of the time, and we were like that, we price per megabyte. I'm sorry, but who from us understands how many megabytes we need to watch 10 minutes uh, YouTube video? No customer can understand that. It's even worse. It's even worse with the development of new services. When I use this device, I've got Dropbox on it. It's synchronizing. I don't even know when. Or I listen to my music. It comes from the cloud of Apple. I don't know if it's listening to the music which is on the device or in the cloud. So how far? How, why would I accept as a customer to be invoiced per megabyte where I can't even decide the volume of data in the future which is being generated on this device? So therefore, we decided to go for unlimited data because basically that's what customer wants. That's what all of us want, we have here. But we will differentiate on speed, which is the last dimension, because speed, people are used to it on the fix, because speed is tangible. You know, it's the quality of the experience that you have. And so we introduced new uh, tariffs in the mobile, which you see here, with, um, with some, uh, some prices. And so we had to segment the speed that people will get on their mobile, and you can decide as a customer, depending on your usage, what you want to do. You just want to do an email? You know, XS is good enough for you, but you should, should you pay something extraordinary? You want to do massive cloud uh, and synchronize all the time? Use an Excel, you know, you can have it done with. Naturally, not everybody can do that. Not all tempos can do that. Because one big prerequisite to do it is to have massively invested into your infrastructure. Because to be able to differentiate by speed, you need to have invested. If you have not invested, you can't differentiate. Because when somebody pays $100 to get 21 meg, he needs to get his 20 meg leg most of the time. Most of the time. So you need to have invested. Now, when is the right moment to make that move? I argue it's now. So I made the decision so I'm a bit biased. But um, the reason is, today, when you look at the development of the erosion of these prices of meter revenue, it's accelerating. But today, it still has a value. Today, the vast majority of the people are paying for voice, are paying for SMSs. So when is the right time to make the migration? Is when these services still have a value for the customer. Because in five years, you know, people will say, it's, it's worth zero. So you won't be able to convert that pot of money in the monthly subscription. So there is an advantage of moving fast in changing the business model, in changing the pricing to preserve that amount of money at the moment where customers value it. Since, just as an anecdote, you know, I, I looked up uh, in, the, in the, at the airport coming here, you know, our stock price evolution, and we, we did introduce the tariff here. So which means that, you know, stock market, well, there might be a lot of things in the stock market first. But it's very interesting to see that the fear of this Peter Martin going away, you know, is everywhere. You know, you read any analyst report, 
though it seems that we might have found something that satisfies also the dynamic of the industry. Last concluding point, now for me, I'm a strong believer of this ecosystem. I'm a strong believer, believer of being customer-centric in the pricing. I think that generates a huge opportunity for everybody, for operators, because we have the profit pools to make the further, in, the further investments. It's an opportunity for OTTs because they will have massive bandwidth, you know, unlimited traffic, so they can innovate with new products. And we are not competing. There is not this fear that you're going to eat me, I'm going to eat your cake. Now we can work together because we have get rid of this tension. Third, customer enjoy freedom. You know? So then if I have freedom, then I use the service. I don't think, oh, damn, I'm in the US, I'm going to have all these prices. I don't know, then I won't use it. And last but not least, you know, if all the players do that, then the economic growth will go up. So that's some perspective that I wanted to share with you, a bit black and white, but I thought it's so powerful. Thank you. pricing rule, leveraging the infrastructure, bundling it with uh, aspects of the business where Swiss can still have market power, something akin to the way the international logistics carriers responded to the Skype initial threat. So the question is up right now, but definitely in that direction. So let's move to, to uh, another presentation, please, Paul, uh, an analyst that has been at the forefront of the development of broadband and its international economic impact. Thank you. And uh, of course, I will have to say I'm from the trans-Pacific area, not the trans-Atlantic area. So next time, no, next time, guys, you will have to put trans-Atlantic and trans-Pacific on it. Yeah? Um, so I'm from Australia, and we have an enormous uh, strong delegation because our minister is here as well. So, you know, we really want to show uh, the Pacific impact here. Uh, what I would like to uh, discuss with you is uh, what I call the trans-sector approach to infrastructure. And what I mean by that is that we have reached a point that the telecommunications infrastructure is actually the wrong word because it has very little to do with the old way of, trend of telecommunications. And we now clearly start talking about the digital economy, we start talking about digital media, e-health, tele-education, smart grids and things like that. So this is a totally different market, has nothing to do with the old market, and in that respect, the telecommunications industry is facing exactly the same as the retail, as the publishers, as the music industry, companies like Kodak. You know, if we don't transform, we will be the same dinosaurs as we are ridiculing at the moment in other parts of the world. It is a bit strange that the telecommunications industry is actually the basis of all of this, and it's uh, an industry that is uh, resisting the transformation to the digital economy in, in a big way. So it's really uh, a bit strange that we are on one side the leaders and on the other side the, the laggards in, uh, in this area. Now, if you start looking at, uh, at the, the telecommunications industry and you start looking at it uh, ten, uh, you know, the last century, the middle of last century, when we built out telephone networks, at that point in time, that was the, the business model, the, 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 the whole model was about <coughs> regional and national monopolies. And that was to quickly roll out uh, the telephone network, and it was all seen in the national interest. It was very important to do that for nation building, similar as we did with the electrification, <coughs> roads, and things like that. So telecommunications had this national interest issue uh, all the time for more, most of uh, for 130 years of its 160 years of existence. Yeah? Then, of course, uh, we start reaching, in the 1980s, a lack of innovation. Uh, you know, we clearly saw new technologies coming up. The telcos were not reacting quick enough. So then, actually, liberalization started. Competition arrived. And, uh, you know, that gave an enormous boost over the last 30 years in telecommunications. The whole way of competition, lowering prices, lots and lots of new products. And the internet is a, is a result of that liberalization. You know, the, what happened with the internet is a result of the, of the liberalization of that period of time. But now we've reached another uh, inflection point where we are saying, hey, you know, where are, we going, uh, where are we going next? If you start looking at the things that I'm talking about, healthcare, education, smart grids, etc., yeah, then you typically start looking at totally different business models. Yeah? 
it's not possible to an advance this whole area of the of the these services if you stick to the old model that we've had in the past of vertically integrated telcos. You know, with, with you know, if you're lucky with wholesale, but sometimes not even wholesale and, and managed services. You know, they are the gatekeepers, and you can't have the, the same gatekeepers that were effective and make sense in the telephone world, but that don't make sense in the situation of healthcare, etc. At that point in time. These sectors that are going to use the infrastructure need to have access to that infrastructure at a utilities cost basis. You cannot, they cannot pay the premium that normally applies into a telecommunications network. Otherwise, you cannot deliver billions of end-to-end <coughs> -end devices or monitor old-age people at their homes and things like that. You have to really start changing the business model. Uh, and in, in a situation like that, you come to the conclusion that there is really there have to be different business models for the infrastructure and there have to be different models for, for, for the services. At the same time, most of us come to the conclusion that it doesn't really make sense to duplicate the infrastructure. Particularly if you start talking about fiber to the home infrastructure, you know, it doesn't make sense to have two fiber to the home infrastructures to each house, etc. So you really start coming back to some sort of a natural monopoly in the whole situation of uh, fixed networks. I'm not talking about mobile here, I'm talking about fixed networks. So how are we going to do that? Now, what I would like to do is use the example of Australia. As several speakers have said, there's absolutely no silver bullet. You know, in my work with the, the United Nations Broadband Commission, I always say there is, you know, each country has to find its own solution based on the political situation, the geographic situation, the cultural situation, you know, the financial situation, so there's absolutely no silver bullet. So, if I talk to the, to the Qatar people, then, you know, it's a different model than what we use in Australia, or when I talk to the Brits or the Irish or the Dutch or whatever. You know, I did a presentation in the White House talking to the American government. Differently, again, a totally different model, yeah? But the, the whole issue everywhere is exactly the same. Everybody wants to use the infrastructure for a large range of services. Now, the telcos are saying, yes, that's fantastic, yeah, but that uh, all these social and economic benefits don't show up on my balance sheet, yeah. So what's the problem, yeah, that, uh, that we have, that we are facing here is the fact that what we want to do as a nation or as people, yeah, does not necessarily reflect the financial situation of the, of the telcos. So what we need to do in moving forward is fix the balance, yeah, of the, fix the balance sheet of the telcos in order to make that work. Now, if you now reach to the next situation, you know, where we are moving towards the future, then we start looking at uh, massive investments, as, as many people already have mentioned, you know. In Australia, the fiber to the home network was $40 billion. So, you know, that's not peanuts. So how are you going to actually then uh, get this, uh, this, this balance sheet in order, in, 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 in order to, to move forward? In Australia, what we've decided, is we uh, developed a national broadband network that's in fiber to the home infrastructure and the minister is going to talk about it in more detail uh, and at the same time we offer uh, we operate we operate a structurally separated uh, regular regime at the moment so the infrastructure is totally separated from the services the national infrastructure company is a is a construction company it puts in the fiber it's only allowed to provide a wholesale service and for the rest, everything happens on top of it. Now, the reason why this all happened is also important, because in 2005-06, we, uh, we had uh, Telstra, owned uh, the whole fixed network, was a mobile operator, also owned the pay television, the, the, the cable television network in Australia. So there was, there was no dynamics to actually get infrastructure competition going in any, in any direction. And Telstra didn't really want to come to the party. They said, okay, we want to okay, we want to put fiber to the note in 50% of the houses in Australia, and we want a 13-year holiday to deliver that uh, 560k uh, service for $95 a month. And they wanted a 13-year holiday on that. Now, the previous government, you know, the Liberal government, uh, said, over oh, my dead boy. They also sued the minister twice, yeah, in order to get its way, and then they actually, uh, they, they stopped. So then the government came in heavy-handed and said, you know, guys, if you can't negotiate with you, then, you know, this is the rules, this is how we're going to do it. That's how we got the National Broadband Network and structural separation. 
At that point in time, the previous CEO was, um, uh, went, uh, went away and went back to the United States, and uh, a new CEO arrived, and he said, I love this. I like to work with that. It saves me building, fixing up my aging proper network. I don't have to pay for that. Yeah? I can concentrate on services and value-added value -added stuff you know, along the line that you, Stefan, are talking about. We really like that. They told you the new CEO, basically what, for example, they, he invested uh, a billion dollars into cloud computing. And he got a contract with 17,000 GPs in Australia. And he's building the e-health system for uh, the GPs. And obviously, beyond that, he's looking at all sorts of other e-health. They want to be the mini telco in e-health. They want to be the mini telco in environmental sustainability and talk to utilities and others to build things like that. They want to be the mini telco in education and start building services like that. That's what I call innovation. That's what I call different business models. That's what I call where you really start seeing a company is transforming itself totally in order to participate in this new environment. Now you can argue about this in five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years from now, but Australia took the decision the future will definitely be on the fixed network, will definitely be fiber. We don't argue about when that will happen, it will happen. So we take the first step now and make that happen. Now, other companies, as I mentioned, you know, others will do it differently. You can actually do it within a telco and you can actually start facilitating different services as we were talking about yesterday with, with Deutsche Telekom. Yeah? Uh, you know, Verizon is doing a good job in the end to end and start operating totally new different different business models in that area. Yeah? On the other side, you see that, for example, if you just let things go, you create another monopoly and you go through the whole litigation process, the regulatory process, as we did in the 1980s, and we create a new regulatory environment in, 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 in whatever is done. I don't think it's a smart way of doing that. It's much smarter to take the initiative now, go through the transformation, yeah? Start looking at new business models, and the good thing is that companies like Telstra and Singtel, big companies, big telcos, yeah, are seeing the model, they're not opposing it, they have embracing it, and they are seeing that this is fixing the balance sheet problem that was created by the burden of this whole new infrastructure that is facing them, and they really did want to invest in that. Thank you. You're starting to get a sense of the range of, 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 of alternatives and how actually, rather than a commonality perspective, there are some of the divergence that will stimulate the discussion. I mean, uh, Paul gave us a little bit of a sense of, uh, of words like natural monopoly and, and, and consolidating the central uh, uh, position along the transport value chain. And, and the construction of these sorts, some of a two-sided or multi-sided market, where 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 the telco is positioned at the center, um, platform mediating transactions between consumers and enterprises, providing customized solutions. Somewhat akin to uh, 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 Verizon's position, except that Verizon didn't raise the issue of natural monopoly. So uh, with that, let's move to to the next thing. Is it? the Asian uh, territory. Uh, Professor Yu, you from uh, Taipei, in the US perspective on OTT, focusing on the video market. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, it's a great pleasure uh, to speak at this important conference and focusing on the innovative topics. Uh, I will focus on the OTT videos business model because, you know, uh, some of the natural operators also offer um, IPTV or multi-screen strategies or services. So I think it's also important. And also uh, I will um, share my observation about four countries uh, OTT videos business models um, from Asia. And uh, it's very ambitious between four countries in the minutes. Okay, uh, so um, uh, I don't have to talk about the online. And this is a value chain. So we have uh, content providers, uh, aggregator, and distributor, and then device provi uh, providers. And who are the players? Not only uh, network operators, the ISPs and content aggregators, joint venture and set up box providers and TV manufacturers. And also the operation models you can see, uh, they can provide the service 
through its own set of box or through somebody else's set of box or through connected TV or collaborate with network operators or to use APP. And these are all the applications. We can talk about that later, so many kind of applications. And also the pricing model, we have free model, and also hybrid model, monthly fee, pay-per-view package, you name it, we have all kinds of pricing models. And the, the uh, innovation in technology and the content, we have new commerce, uh, new content, new devices, new pricing models. Here we go. I'll talk about Japan first. In Japan, the OTT TV providers we have, such as Activita. Activita is an alliance of several um, manufacturers, such as Hitachi uh, uh, and also Panasonic. And we also have uh, Hulu from the USA and also uh, Gaia. Um, but in Japan, the OTT TV service is kind of slow and because it's like a programming and the content providers hesitate to put their programs online. And there are not many on-demand uh, videos available online. And also you can see that the DVD rental release window is open long before it becomes available for any streaming site. And also uh, when you go everywhere, see, uh, you can find uh, rental shops and also uh, the user um, interface needs to be improved. And I think this is also important for the OTT service. Uh, in Japan, watching TV is still more of a kind of passive on the social experience. And uh, um, broadcast TV programming can be accessed on many devices, so that is Japan. Then in Korea, I want to give you two very prominent examples. First of all, I want to talk about um, KTT's subsidiary. KTT merged the Skylight, and uh, they um, uh, work together. And the first one I want to talk about is KT Korea Telecom's Skylight. And Skylight uh, offer a kind of DCS uh, service. DCS is kind of like a dish convergence solution. It transmits digital broadcast through the internet. They try to eliminate the need of a disk-shaped antenna. So um, uh, KT, uh, KT Skylab argued uh, its service was practically the same as IBTV, which also used the web to transmit programs. But cable companies in, uh, in South Korea they then complains to the uh, KCC, the regulator. So that is the first case. It was um, uh, considered as illegal by the regulator. The second case is about net neutrality. You can see this is also an important issue in the United States. It also happened in South Korea. In South Korea, uh, can, uh, Samsung's smart TV case. Korea Telecom didn't uh, allow uh, Samsung's um, uh, smart TV to use its broadband infrastructure as a delivery mechanism for their content and refused to pay uh, KT. And KT insisted that it must be compensated for the connected TV traffic based on its network. Now uh, I want to talk about China. Uh, in China, there are seven OTT TV licenses holders. Uh, the government only, the regulator only grant the license to the major broadcast networks. Uh, there are famous uh, uh, online content portals such as uh, Tudo and uh, YouTube. They, uh, they cannot uh, receive a license uh, from the regulator. Uh, just like I IPTV license, it always goes to the broadcast networks, not to the telcos. And most of the uh, big TV groups in China, they are aware of different kind of services and also like the OTT, so uh, they think about this as a kind of co-opetition, so they also try to provide the service. We can enjoy the example from Beijing and Shanghai. There's combination, collaboration between a cable company and a China Mobile Beijing. And also we see that in Shanghai, their IPTV service also try to co collaborate with other um, uh, services. And in, in China, uh, you only pay three US dollars to four US dollars per month for, uh, to get cable. So it's very cheap. Then do people uh, want to pay for the new platform? That is a question. And also the regulation is always um, in favor of the TV groups or broadcasters. So in China, broadcasters are still dominant in the TV market. It's a, uh, it's a pity that the telcos can only provide a broadband if they do not get the license. Okay, then in Taiwan. In Taiwan, um, 
uh, I want to give you two examples. There are so many examples, but we can focus on some. For instance, like the first one, I wanted you can take uh, take a look about the picture. You see two set of us. One is the black one, another is the blue one. The black one is um, Zhonghua Telecom, the dominant player. Zhonghua Telecom's uh, set of us is bigger, and the blue one is provided by so-called next VOD. Next VOD. Next VOD. Okay, is a, a, a very uh, uh, prominent example about OTT video service in Taiwan. You know, it belongs to a, a, a big group, and this group is famous for its Apple Daily News. It's newspaper, and it also has newspaper and video service and others. Uh, it try to compete with Zhonghua Telecom, the network operators. Okay, we try to, the competition is kind of uh, getting fierce. So, um, next, Next, uh, VOD's uh, positioning strategy is to emphasize one account via more devices. So you can get your service uh, from uh, their set-up box or somebody else's set-up box, or you know to be embedded. Uh, for instance, like the uh, uh, smart TV, uh, they have a kind of co uh, cooperation collaboration with Samsung and Panasonic. So if you buy a, a TV set from uh, Samsung and, and Panasonic, you can see their, uh, you can receive their service. Uh, and also, uh, they also collaborate with cable uh, uh, MSO. Okay, so you can see uh, different kinds of uh, um, price uh, mechanism and different kinds of subscription services. Also, the next one I want to talk about is also very, uh, this one has potential because Zhonghua Telecom um, uh, IPTV service is very dominant in the market, dominant in the market, uh, the biggest one. And it also wants to, you know, grab some uh, revenue from somebody else, from other um, telcos or other providers, you know, other ISPs. So it uh, tried to uh, establish a firm with another company you must know, I, I think you must have uh, heard about, uh, hear about this com company is HTC. HTC, the phone manufacturer. So they have this joint venture. They want to do this together. Okay, see, this is the infrastructure. On the left, you see Zhonghua Telecom, the blue one. The red one, they, you know, also through Zhonghua Telecom's IPT set up box. But in the beginning, they kind of low profile. They want to see, they, they, they try to provide four kinds of um, um, services. Uh, it's a game like chess, and also e-learning, and also golf, and also stock market and financial news. They want to do this uh, um, step by step. Okay, so um, the OTD services are facing challenges. They're facing like if the download is slow, then the obvious uh, the, the users will lose patience. So uh, they have facing so many challenges. Okay, lack of lack of uh, innovative content, the copyright issues, release window. And uh, okay, so my conclusion is. Um, you know, what are the successful factors? Successful factors for the OTT video services. Well, bandwidth is important, okay? Broadband speed and also user, uh, user interface and also the compelling in, uh, content. We uh, need to provide some uh, innovative, exclusive content. We should have uh, cheap price and different kind of bundling um, packages and flexible pricing models and one accountable devices and also um, the quality service and to have uh, multiple revenue model, and also you've got to have deep pockets to acquire content. That concludes my presentation from you. Thank you, um, Professor Liu. And, uh, in addition to the, um, uh, the wealth of, of experiences that are occurring in Asia, I think that there's a dominant message here coming up what collaboration is a good concept, and that entails sharing rents as like a value chain in maybe a declining price realization market that creates conflict. So it's good to say collaboration, but that doesn't mean that it's a magic solution for problems. And with that, I'll introduce Professor Wilkie from USC. So, well, why is it they suspect when you introduce Australians, there's going to be no collaboration? <laughs> Um, unfortunately, um, my presentation, when I looked at it, it's unrelentingly bleak. So, uh, 
we might skip through some of the stuff uh, a little bit more quickly. Um, so I'm going to talk about what we can just try and size what this effect is and what it means for um, the incumbent um, cable companies and telcos. Uh, so here are some numbers. So based on survey data mostly. So Bernstein research um, in 2009 um, found that 35% of responders uh, stated they would consider cancelling cable TV subscription within the next five years in favor of online. Um, uh, that's one number. Um, I'm going to work through this pretty quickly because we're short on time. Uh, SNL Canyons uh, found a similar um, number and they're projecting um, the number of cable subscribers to drop from 63 to 60 million. Uh, Yankee Group, and this is the number that I'm going to keep in mind, uh, survey said 22% of all respondents stated that they plan to spend less on their TV subscription services this year than last year. 35% of respondents stated that they would reduce their spending by eliminating premium content packages. Okay. And the Yankee Group study says one in eight consumers um, will cancel or reduce their pay TV subscription service this year. And it turns out I'm one of them, but I really promise. Uh, so, uh, all of these surveys are along the same um, lines. Um, uh, we've had an increase in the number of um, households that are not subscribing to MVPD. That's in the US, multi uh, MVPD is paperless, it's that one. Uh, and Verizon. Quite awesome. Uh, so we've actually had a declining number of households for the last few years, which is quite uh, a radical shift. Um, over 25 million households regularly watch full-length TV shows on the net now. Uh, so let's do a little bit of math. So suppose um, uh, Jim or Jackie is selling to a high-end customer a video package at $50 a month. And suppose we have 100 million households and population based in the US that could be subscribed to MVP and service. And suppose 20% of them, this is in that range of numbers, decide to cut the cord. Okay. We're talking about a billion dollar a month debt to the industry with infrastructure providers. We're talking about $12 billion a year. Um, so uh, that's what we're looking at. Roughly speaking, uh, if we assume that a high end customer is going to have to go with $50, I think that's probably not that far off from reality. Okay? Um, so here's a couple more studies, uh, but they're all coming up with the same numbers. Uh, it's a remarkable resilient. So, what's going on? In one word, disintermediation. Uh, that is the breaking up of the traditional value chain, the traditional definition of a firm, the traditional definition of in terms of antitrust, what a product market is, what a product is. Um, and this intermediation has introduced a couple of new prospects, which is that traditionally, if I subscribe to video content, it's bundled with the infrastructure that I get a bit from. If I'm a dish subscriber, I get a satellite put on my roof, and I get the content, the, the package that this shells me. Okay. What you're possibly seeing is the breakdown in that bundle. That is, I could be a dish subscriber and choose to get my dish content through their sling product and watch it over Comcast broadband network. I can tell you, yeah, I like dish, I don't really want it. <laughs> Just give me the programming back. Okay. Similarly, I live in an uh, area where Charter is the incumbent cable company. I could decide, I really like Comcast X Infinity video programming package, okay, which is Comcast brand on the uh, IP delivered um, television company. So I could get Charter Broadband and try and approach Comcast and say, look, I'll, I'll buy my video programming package from you and uh, I'll get it delivered over my broadband network, even though I'm not in a Comcast. Um, area of Comcast infrastructure. So what does that mean? That means we now, if we do see this disintermediation, we'll have competition to be the pipe provider, and then competition to be the provider of the bundled package of services. Right? And so now we're going to see a dramatic increase in the number of competitors in providing that bundle, the video bundle. So even without new entry, we're going to have an increase in competition. 
definition of fossil fuel is, is the mediation happens um, for the delivery of the material content itself. Okay. So, and nobody's really factored that in, uh, as far as I know. And so this leads us to uh, what uh, Craig Moffat, I think, calls the dumb pipes paradox, which is what economists call Bertrand paradox, the paradox of Bertrand competition in an industry where you have low marginal costs and high fixed costs. In equilibrium, they can't both exist, right? Competition and uh, uh, firms break the even. So that's the paradox. So something has to give. So what has to give? Well, you have to get rid of the assumption of perfect competition. And one solution that's being mentioned is to declare it a natural monopoly and move on. Uh, another solution, which we tend to see in marketplaces, is increases in product differentiation. Right? I can charge a different price if I've got a differentiated product. And so how is that differentiated product um, activity likely to play out in this scenario? Well, first of all, I think you're going to see an increase in vertical integration. For the last few years, we've actually seen a lot of vertical separation, like um, uh, uh, in the Comcast AT&T um, merger, uh, uh, back when I was in FCC, we saw Time Warner spin off assets, uh, we saw the breakup of Tweet. Um, now I think we're going to see the vertical reintegration between content provisions and pipelines in order to provide differentiated products. You're going to see increasing use and prevalence of exclusives for exactly the same reasons. And you're going to see the issue arise, whether there's meat to it or not, of self-dealing and preferential treatment i.e. we're going to face a whole lot of new regulatory issues, which are, as Ellie alluded to at the start, the exact same regulatory issues that we've been looking at in different contexts. Uh, it's just going to be a new set of, a new set of plans. Um, and so uh, that's basically where we are. So I think we're going to see new challenges for regulators. Um, the, this is going to be intense because the amount of money involved is so substantial. Um, and maybe this is just going to be, uh, as I said, old regulatory wine in new bottles. Um, but then this raises the specter to introduce the next uh, discussion of is there a different Australian solution? Okay, that's it. Thank you, Simon. Um, he pretty much outlined the battle of epic proportions that is about to uh, start or continue going forward in terms of continuing the sort of in, uh, in, in economic terms so far. So, we have 10 minutes for questions from uh, the audience. And uh, if you raise your hands, I'm going to be pointing at it. Uh, yep. Uh, Benny, please introduce yourself. Uh, I'm Brian Savin from the Confidence Center. Um, question to, uh, to, to Simon. Uh, Simon, what do you see as the, uh, as the, uh, the advantages and disadvantages of vertical integration of carriers with content in terms of um, innovation, economic stimulation, consumer welfare? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, that's a dissertation. Um, <clears throat> I think the, historically, you know, the evidence on that is mixed. Um, sometimes uh, that type of vertical integration, um, it solves what uh, has been labeled uh, by Howard Shalansky and, um, and Joe Farrell, um, the integration of complementary externalities, right? So it can lead to efficiencies. Um, in particular, uh, when there's issues of division of the revenue um, that you might not be able to capture. Um, the other thing that often fosters innovation, though not particularly politically popular, is when you have that type of integration, it's also possible to use more sophisticated price discrimination, which can also be efficiency enhancing and uh, foster innovation. On the other hand, it can also create bottlenecks and the denial of access to competitors that create um, programming um, uh, can, can, can have a quite negative effect. And um, seeing how we have an international audience, there are mentioned 
you know, the behavior of Rupert Murdoch um, in satellite uh, industries in uh, uh, Italy, for instance, where we get control of the sports programming and drive the other guy out of business. Or well, something like that also happened in Australia, I believe, with, with, with uh, Optus and Telstra. Uh, so internationally, we have examples of where that type of um, vertical integration and exclusivity can actually harm both innovation and competition. But it, it, it's, it's a fundamentally difficult question. It depends on the parameters of the, the, each case at hand. I think it has to be done on a case by case basis. Okay. Um, please, here. Uh, I think the mic is coming. Paul Toomey of Ogo Pacific, call me if I can for the purpose of this question. Um, particularly for Jackie, I'm, I'm taken with your presentation about quality of service, and I suppose the question I have is to what degree do you see that something that comes through specific telco networks vis a vis the ability to provide quality of service across the full public internet? Um, and there are people in the internet engineering task force who are very skeptical about the ability for the full public internet to use to provide quality of service. And my question is partly in the context of the ETNO proposals for the WC for Wigan in December. But do you see quality of service, service and Vincent, you mentioned as well, do you see it as something that's, that's provided within the network of a particular telco, or do you see it as feasibly something delivered across the full public network? Uh, I'm sure we'll have a lot more discussion of uh, that term as used in the context of the ITU proposal later. When I was talking about it, I think I, I referred to quality of service or connection in a U.S. network in a pretty simple way, really, which is that if you're interconnecting closer to the ultimate customer, then uh, there's less latency and so on, and that can be uh, a better quality of service from the point of view of the content. Uh, so I would defer the, the broader discussion to later, but the fact that it's even an, a quite an open question about whether one can engineer and, and quality of service, to me just illustrates the general point I was trying to make in the end, which is that we should be very careful about taking things that are very fluid and of the moment and somehow codifying those into a detailed international training. I'm going to make the point that uh, the models that are being uh, focused on here are largely consumer driven. And one of the things that's happening with clouds, uh, I'm Bob Cohen, I'm the director of the TM Forums Enterprise Cloud Leadership Council, and I work with about two dozen large enterprise cloud users. Uh, one of the things that's happening is that as large corporations adopt clouds, they're essentially outsourcing a lot of the infrastructure and service spending. So in fact, the economics of spending on services and infrastructure is going to be shifted from these companies to the telco. And there's a fair amount, I mean, if you just look at the banks alone, global banks, probably, well, U.S. banks invest probably somewhere between 200 and 300 million a year in infrastructure and services. Other industries are much smaller, probably the pharmaceutical industry invests something like 10, 15, 20 billion a year. But this is a, you know, talk about a $12 billion deficit. The banks alone, on an annual basis, will far more than make up for any consumer losses. And the banks are planning to have kind of a uh, you know, I'd like to get any services from anywhere, which means a highly integrated national and global infrastructure links with service providers such as cloud service brokers. And I think that's the model that you have to look at for the economics of this next uh, transformation using OTT. Um, I uh, totally agree with you. You know, I think that the future for the network operators as we are discussing today, is far more in wholesale yeah, than in retail. And wholesale in the situation exactly as you described. You actually use a cloud uh, to create a new market for whatever product or service or company or whatever sector you want. And you actually then, in that cloud, you build another vertical yeah, 
integrated service yeah, that is made available to the customers of that wholesaler. So the customers could be healthcare patients, uh, people that buy videos, uh, you know, companies that buy fashion or whatever. Yeah? So you, uh, re, uh, customers that buy fashion, fashion or, or something like that. So you really what you start seeing is that you create uh, through the cloud uh, 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 the, the, the facility for the retailers for, to sell to their, to their customers. But the underlying sort of uh, infrastructure, I call it value-added infrastructure, is actually the area where I see where the network operators are going to concentrate in the future. Create that environment where you can actually, you as a company, participate in digital economy, you as a healthcare organization can participate in e-health or whatever. Rather than all of those organizations are trying to do that on their own, the telcos, can, the network operators can create these clouds and these services uh, you know, on, on top of that network. So they become over-the-top network providers themselves. But uh, one of the issues is... Just to give you a perspective from a telco, we are currently operating that business. Uh, you know, from Switzerland, naturally, we have all the banks and the pharmaceuticals. We have some quite a few as well. And uh, yes, there is an opportunity, but the margin are very low. So I think, you know, whereas your statement is right in revenue, I argue that in margin, you know, you are, you know, black moon. <laughs> and uh, that still makes a huge difference. And you can't replace everything just like that. I think you can do it. You can do it for specific applications. But the margin are not of the same order of magnitude by far, by very far. But you can actually offer extra services. That's a telephone. Yes, Calvo, Calvo International. I, I have heard a lot of interesting models at this panel, but from the kind of global perspective, they're all pretty much top-down models. And globally, we have something approaching 6 billion co connected people. Uh, over 4 billion of those are mobile only. Over 4 billion of those are emerging markets. The biggest innovations of the last 15 years, uh, prepaid mobile banking that come from emerging markets. Mexico is the first prepaid place, Kenya, and now the Philippines and other countries are moving ahead with mobile banking. So the, the assumption I take with many of the models I've heard is that eventually these things will trickle down to this other much bigger market, which contributes you know, way over half of the revenues of, of the whole industry at this point, even though the ARPUs are very low. Is that the right assumption to make, or, or should we also be looking at some models that are coming from the bottom up, so to speak? And, and what might those models be, and who's pursuing them? Absolutely. Is it the Chinese, the Kenyans? Oh, yes. Yeah. Vince, you want to check with that? I mean, Kamali, we're not talking still the same amounts, as you mentioned. I mean, India is probably very large in terms of users, but in terms of market, we don't see it. Uh, they don't have that much of a finding, for instance. I mean, it's, it, it's a very small market, so we, we're going to get some, uh, obviously, some impacts, especially on standardization, on economy of scale, and, and some development from there. But uh, we're not starting from the same situation in which, I mean, the market is small. The market is, 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 there is, there is growth for those, for those countries. Uh, and what we're trying to address uh, for the other countries is more like the care, a potential decline, uh, or even a decline already uh, in the wireless industry and so on, and you need to reinvent yourself. So it's not the same starting point at all, and, and obviously some, some of the big countries are trying to, in fact, to, uh, to take growth from those emerging countries. Uh, and we've seen it's not necessarily that easy, uh, even for the bigger ones. So it's, it's still, for me, very different, uh, yeah. And uh, for the last question, we we'll to Last question, good privilege. <laughs> this actually is not so much a question for the panel, but for the audience. I'd like to just uh, raise, the, raise hands in response. First of all, how many are U.S., live in the United States and subscribe U.S. cell phone? Okay. Who prefers uh, the Swisscom? Pricing model of all you can eat. 
<laughs> Sign me up. <laughs> and, well, the price is price by speed. Yeah, yeah price yeah. by speed. And so we got, which is different. It's we don't right. have. I right. don't know that we have a price by speed flat, but speed. Yeah. Yeah. Who likes that plan? Yeah. 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 Price by speed. Yeah. 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 Who wants to keep their existing one? <laughs> 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 Price by speed. Yeah. 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 Okay, uh, I think that's it for it. I, I just wanted to see what the reaction to that was. <laughs> Out of time. Sorry. Uh, so, uh, so that's that's the end for the panel. Uh, uh, I think that we should probably thank uh, the panel for quite a lot of Let me pass on the baton to, to Professor Wilkie uh, to introduce the next speaker. <laughs>